Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at building a recommendation system, and we're going to be using the Be In Learn package to achieve this. All right, so imagine a situation that our boss wants us to create a, a system that, let's say, a customer goes on the internet, they're shopping around our website, and as they put things in their basket, what we want to do, we want to create a model that says, hey, you would really like this item, you should put it in your basket. That way we make more money. So we could do this like at a kiosk, uh, such as like at Wawa or at uh, McDonald's. Uh, we could do this for an, a shopping app. We could do this for, you know, something like similar to Amazon, uh, you know, Netflix, you know, you know, we see this all the time. Our goal is to make the best one possible. Now, uh, there's several different ways to achieve this. Uh, almost all of them that I can think of are using, or all the efficient ones I can think of, uh, use a conditional probability model to achieve this. So for example, the A rules package uh, uses conditional probability. Here, we're gonna try and use a graphical model for this. Why, do, why am I choosing a graphical model for this? I feel it's actually more natural uh, for the structure of the problem. I feel like it's a more, it's an easier interface to work with for me to actually execute and use. So we're going with graphical models. Uh, also, you know, it's more natural to not have to worry about things like support, confidence, and lift if we're using the algorithms in the BN Learn package. Because really, uh, under the hood, that package has it set up that you know support, confidence, and lift are kind of already dealt with for us. So we don't have to think about it. We don't have to evaluate individual rules. Uh, it, we just kind of like run it and grab it and go. So I, I prefer it, but you know I can see that there are other situations where a classical uh, mar you know market basket analysis would be better. Okay, so uh, okay, so our point of view for this model is that at any given moment, we want to recommend an item so that the customer puts one more item in their basket. We always say, I want them to get one more item. So what we want to do, we want to identify which one item is the most likely one for them to put in their basket given what they've already selected. And uh, in the structure of this problem, uh, we're putting in a, a binary one or a true, depending on where we are with data. Uh, we're putting in a marker if there is one or more, and we're putting a zero if there's none in there. So one means one or more, zero be means none, as we look at this. So we're not, we're not gonna worry about, you know, do they have two hamburgers, do they have 10 hamburgers? Uh, we're just saying, if there's a hamburger in there, it's a one. All right, so to achieve this, we're gonna go ahead and use the groceries data set uh, in the A rules package. So what we've got going on, we're in a situation that we're gonna try, like someone's doing their grocery shopping, maybe they're shopping online, uh, maybe they're using their phone to scan in items for coupons and for uh, check prices as they're going through and doing their shopping. And what we want to do, we're gonna go, hey, 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 remember the milk, hey, 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 you need butter. You know, we want them to go and get one more item and put it in their basket. All right, so when we uh, pull in the data, uh, the A rules package stores the grocery data set in a sparse format. This is memory wise, this is a very efficient format, but this is not a very good format for uh, the be and learn package. So we're gonna have to convert it. And so here I'm using the as, uh, function to convert it to a matrix, and uh, it, so in the sport in the sparse matrix format, uh, R does this very well. And then I convert it to a data frame. Now, why did I just convert it to a data frame? Uh, you know, it, uh, you know, initially I had data frame here instead of matrix. I, it didn't really work out, so I just added one additional step. Uh, going from matrix to data frame really is, you know, really really quick. It's not much of an issue. Then here, I'm using the make names function to set it up so that all names in the data set, all, all item names, so like uh, if I have like whole milk, it'll be whole dot milk. This is to make all the columns syntactically correct with an R. Uh, this will prevent problems when you start using some functions. Uh, so I just do it as a habit. I always go for it. Um, 
and if it, uh, but you know, you could probably skip this step. All right, so now let's take a look at what we have in our data initially. All right, so we can see that, okay, so this is showing the first six baskets and the first six items as listed in the data set. So we, first item is frankfurter, sausage, liver loaf, ham, meat, finished products. So we kind of like have a bunch of meats uh, on our first few columns. And we can see that none of the first six baskets have these first six items. Now this is a much bigger data set. This data set has almost 10,000 rows and has uh, you know, almost 170 columns. So there's much more going on. Uh, we're just looking at uh, some of it just so that we know what the structure is. All right, well, you know, in, in, as it's organized, it's, it's a little bit harder to see uh, like patterns as I'm working through the project. So what I want to do, I want to go ahead, I want to put my most frequent items on the left, less frequent items on the right, my largest baskets, or my most full baskets, I should say, the ones that have the most distinct items at the top of the data set, and then the, you know, the baskets that have only one item at the bottom. That way, uh, as I look through, you know, I can, it'll be easier for me to interpret what's going on as I see patterns of going on. I can check things, and if I go column by column, I see a pattern going along, I know that you know, column sums may be related to it. If I check row by row, I can see it'll be easier for me to spot a pattern if row sums are important. And so I just go through, I take the data set and I reorder them so that um, the, the, most co the, uh, the baskets with the most distinct items are at the top and then the items that appear in the most baskets are on the left. And that makes it a little bit easier to interpret what's going on. Now, something about this is that, you know, we've got a lot of items. We've got 170 items and conditional probability models take a long time to run. Also, recommendations for rarely purchased items really are not gonna be useful. You know, like if I end up recommending like an exotic, you know, bird feed, you know, at a grocery store. Um, probably not going to get the customer to buy it. And if I recommend something off of some, if I make a recommendation based off a item that's rarely purchased, that rule probably is not going to come into play very often. So it's really not even worth bothering with. So what I want to do at this step is that in, in the model, we're only going to consider items that appear relatively frequently in, in baskets. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we're focusing on too, on too much stuff. We want to get the stuff that uh, customers are prone to putting in their basket when they don't already have it. So if they're not prone to putting it in their basket at all, it's probably going to be a waste of time. So what I decided to do was I want to look at the items that account for 80% of the distinct items in a basket. And so go ahead and do that. All right, so here we're, we're trying uh, I went through and when, uh, so remember I have them sorted. I have it sorted by the column sums. Because I have it sorted by the column sums, what I can do, if I take the cumulative column sums, I can see like what percent, uh, and I divide by the total, um, I can see what is the proportion of the, uh, you know, what, what, how frequently is an item in a particular basket? And then if I go cumulative sum on those column sums, I can see where's the cutoff for the items that account for 80% of sales. All right, so here, if I take a look, about 30% of the items in the data set account for 80% of the distinct items in baskets. 30% of the items account for 80% of the, uh, the items in baskets. I mean, that's, a, that's a pretty strong ratio since we're picking up only, you know, we're looking at the most frequently purchased item, then the second most frequently purchased item, then the third most frequently purchased item, all the way down. So I can greatly reduce this model down to a few items. So, you know, 
we're cutting it down to 53 different items. These are the 53 that I think that uh, we will be the most successful on if we try to uh, sell these to uh, customers to, to recommend them. And so on this step, what I do is I restrict it down to the, to, uh, the 53 items that are the most frequent, and then I restrict the data set to those 53. All right, so how I would choose to do this in real life is any item that's not in uh, this vector here, I just wouldn't even compute it. I wouldn't even consider it. I wouldn't, uh, if uh, the customer you know, put that item in their basket, uh, you know, when they're doing their online shopping, I would just ignore it. I would not use it. I would pretend like there's nothing in the basket for my recommendation. Then when they put in something that is in this 53, then my model activates and starts uh, giving some good information. Now the be and learn package, uh, if I pass it a numeric value, what it's going to do, it's going to do uh, really uh, multiple linear regression on a numeric target variable. So if I have zeros and ones in there and I try to uh, run the model, well, it, it's not going to give me the right format because it's going to make predictions like two and negative one and stuff like that. It doesn't make sense. All right, here we have a binary target of in the basket or not in the basket. Now I went ahead and converted true and false to one and zero uh, just so it's more compact and also it just uh, makes it a little bit easier to interpret for me at times. Um, you know, it's, it's smaller, easier to read. So uh, I convert it to one and zero, and then I convert it to a factor. That way uh, it's just more compact, easier to work with. And the be and learn package prefers uh, factors over characters. All right, so now let's actually build the model. Now, there are plenty of different uh, types of models that we can go with. We can either use a constraint-based algorithm, we can use a score-based algorithm, a, a hybrid algorithm, or a local discovery algorithm. Uh, there are four types for this. There's another classification in the package, but I couldn't get it to run, like the uh, uh, naive Bayes and TAN, I just couldn't get it to run, so I, it's not appearing here. All right. Uh, one thing I did before, uh, you know, when I was writing this up, I went through and I took a subset of the data and I benchmarked each algorithm with the goal of getting an idea of how long it would take for each of the algorithms. Uh, remember, conditional probability models take a long time to run. And so computation time is something we have to consider. So what I did, uh, I, if we go, if we scroll down a little bit, here are all of the constraint-based algorithms, and they are ordered by the time it took when I did my benchmarking. IAMBFDR was the fastest, while PC Stable was the slowest. And then Hill Climber was faster than Taboo. That is, that's the uh, score-based algorithms. Here are the hybrid algorithms, and H2PC was the fastest. RS2MAX2 was uh, the slowest. And then Arcane and Chow Li uh, were the, uh, uh, were the uh, local discovery algorithms. And this one was a little bit faster than this one. Uh, in my experience, the, uh, co the constraint-based algorithms and the score-based algorithms have been the most useful. After that, I would say the hybrid algorithms. And I have never had luck with the local discovery algorithms. Um, I, you know, uh, my experience with the local discovery ones is that they just have too few arrows and arcs to be useful. All right, so now let's go ahead and actually load the be and learn package. And you'll notice that here we're getting some uh, package confusion. You know, so if I, if I wanted to use discretize from the A rules package, I need to specify which package I'm using. Also, we got some package confusion between Sigma for stats and be and learn. Uh, this is why in general, we should use the uh, double colon notation in R uh, whenever we can. Python is better on this aspect. Um, you know, like if it's NumPy, it's NP dot every single time. Um, you know, that, that, that prevents this confusion issue. Uh, you know, something that could help is if we detach the A rules package because we're done with it, but um, I didn't think of that until just now. 
or if I, if I was doing this for work, I would run like all these algorithms. I would end up running it overnight, but for the purpose of this video, it just took too long to run. And I didn't feel like it would be that much more informative. I don't feel like it, it was worth the time. So I went ahead and, and just ran one algorithm for this. Uh, what I would do in real life, if my job depended on this, which someday it might, uh, I would run this code chunk with all of the algorithms that we took a look at a moment ago, all of the constraint-based, score-based, hybrid, and local discoveries. And then I would use uh, uh, Bayesian information criterion, Akaiki's information criterion, log likelihood, or a different network score to determine which model to use. Also, you'll notice that I'm not uh, uh, breaking up the data into train, validate, uh, test. Uh, the reason why I'm not doing that is because in this situation, each, like each entry of the data is a is a is from a target variable. Every column is a target variable, and so that means that we it's just very there's just a lot in there for the purpose of scoring things and just kind of, you know, it's just kind of cumbersome to try and figure out what is the best way to go. I'm being lazy. Truly, I should be doing, uh, you know, I, I should be doing like some cross validation or something like that. But for this case study, I'm skipping over it today. All right, at work, I've had a lot of success with the hill climber algorithm and it's very fast. So, for this purpose, I'm going to go ahead and just use the hill climber algorithm. So this code chunk is the same as the one that's commented out, except uh, for the vector that's being indexed over. So previously, it was the entire list of algorithms we could use, uh, that long vector uh, that uh, we uh, took a look at a moment ago. Here, I've reduced it down just to the hill climber uh, you know, character string. That way it just runs the one item and we get it coming out. Uh, what I would do in real life, if my job depended on it, I would go, I would go over all of the different uh, uh, algorithms and then I would select the, the best one among the list. Now something that's very frustrating about the B and learn packages is that it has multiple model structures. So to take full advantage of the model that we just built, we need to use the B and fit uh, function to convert it to a different format. That way we can make predictions on it. So here I'm taking the bn fit function. I'm converting the hill climber model and I'm using my data set to do that. So what this does, this tells uh, R what so the, the X tells R, what are the arcs and edges between different items that appear in baskets, different nodes. And this one tells R, well, this is how R determines the strength of the relationship between items. All right, so at this point, we have our model and I, I'm calling it BN groceries, so our Bayesian network for groceries. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's actually do a simulation with some of our data to see how would this turn out if we actually went to go do this. All right now, the code for the next the code for this gets kind of cumbersome and dense, uh, but you know the actual implementation for something like this probably I, I I don't see an easier way to go about this for like a real life uh, example. So let's go ahead and proceed. All right, so what I'm going to do. I'm going to just grab six different uh, rows of data, and I want to, you know, try and identify what items should I recommend to that customer. So the, the customer has their basket, they're walking along, and I want to go, hey, put this item in your basket because you really want it. I want to figure out what are they most prone to putting in their basket. So what we're going to do is. I'm going to index a subset of the data. And then I'm going to take that, uh, those rows of data, and then we're going, to, we're going to run our algorithm and make our predictions. Uh, you'll notice that here I sorted the index. 
so I'm doing this because this sets it up so that the, the baskets that have the most items are like the first ones and the ones with the least items are the last. That way it's a little bit easier for me to interpret as I look at the outputs. All right, so when I store my predictions, I'm gonna put in a zero everywhere. So, I'm, and what we're gonna do, if an item is not in the basket, we're going to check what is the probability uh, well, what is the expected value for that item given that I have ones and zeros for all the other items? So our uh, prediction variables are going to be all of the other items and, you know, of zero or one, depending if those items are in the basket or not. And then we're going to try and figure out what is the expected value for the one item we're talking about at a time. So we're going to go along every row and we're going to go along every column and we're going to be making, uh, you know, we're going to be making the predictions with the model. So we're treating uh, the uh, entry of 01 as being a, a Bernoulli uh, variable. And we want the, and we're trying to get, we're trying to estimate the expected value of that. Uh, uh, we want an estimate of the expected value given the state of the other items in the basket. Now, something about this is that if I run the predict function, what uh, B and learn will do by default, it's going to say zero or one. It's going to tell me what's the most likely outcome. It's not going to tell me the probability by default. So what I have to do, I have to use the attributes function, ATTR, to pull out what I want. And so it's a little bit cumbersome, but the, the big concept is that I'm taking the predict function and then I'm extracting the probability off of there. Now, how do I do this? I use str, the, the str function to look at the structure of the output from the predict function. And from there, I was able to figure out what was the actual structure of the output of the predictions. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the first six, you know, the, we got six rows and the first six columns. All right, so remember that whole milk is the most frequently purchased item in the entire data set. Other vegetables is the second most common. Rolls and buns, third. Fourth is soda, yogurt's fifth, and bottled water is sixth. So as you look through this, something that you'll notice in general is that whole milk tends to be uh, prone to coming up as something you should put, as you should recommend in general, regardless of what the values are, because whole milk is very common anyway. So the mo so one thing, if you start running through this model and you start looking through, when you say, hey, there's no whole milk in the basket, this model will be prone to recommending whole milk anyway. Uh, so one thing we could do if we want just a simpler model, we could just recommend the most common items that are not in the basket. That would be a little bit faster, but we could do better uh, with this system. And so for example, if we look at the second basket, the second basket is gonna be uh, more prone to, uh, according to the model, more prone to putting milk in the basket than the first or the third or the fifth or the sixth. So if we're, so like this row, this one probably has whole milk already in there. So we probably don't want to, we don't want to recommend whole milk if it's already in the basket. We want to recommend something else such as other vegetables or another item. Right. So it, as it is right now, you know, this is not sorted by the individual rows. So, it, you know, given the items in a basket, I don't know in this format, it's not easy for me to visually see what is the best item to recommend. So let's go through and let's reshape the data. So this code here, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm going through and I'm extracting the predictions. So I, I've made a list. And the first item in the list is the first basket. So the first, and then uh, I call the 
part of it in basket, these are the items that are in the basket. So these are the ones that have a one in the data set on, the, on that row. And then the promote part of the list are the most, is going to be the items that, can, that are not in the basket sorted from most likely to be added to least likely. So let's take a look. What do we get? All right, for our very first basket, we see that we've got rolls and buns, soda, sausage, pastries, canned beer, pip fruit, fruit vegetable juice, salty snacks, hygiene articles, and candy. Hmm, they might be hosting a party. So what items should we recommend? Well, first thing it says is that we, it, should, it, it wants to recommend other vegetables. That's kind of surprising, but is it? I mean, if we've got rolls and buns and sausages, is it likely that they're gonna be like grilling outside? And don't you like, you know, maybe do some shish kebab, maybe put some corn on the grill, right, right? So we wanna go, hey, 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 you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, get some shish kebab vegetables going, or hey, you, you wanna put corn on there, or maybe some baked potatoes. You know, this would be a really good time to recommend that. Chopping bags, hey, hey, they might be carrying a bunch of stuff. Uh, they don't have any whole milk. Uh, so whole milk will always come up very frequently when it's missing because it's the most common item. Now let's go through, let's look at the other end and see if that makes sense. All right, so we see that beverages is coming out low. Well, didn't they have soda and beer already? Soda, beer, and juice? Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, so we've got soda, we've got beer, and we've got juice. Does it make sense that we are gonna be trying to get them to get beverages? No, because they've already got beverages. They're already covered. Onions. Uh, that, that honestly surprises me. Hamburger meat. Uh, that, uh, that surprises me. I thought hamburger meat would come up more common, but that's what's coming up in these models. We've also already got beef going, so there might be some overlap going on in there. Anything else interesting coming out? Here. All right. Next one, we've got other vegetables, soda, tropical fruit, sausage, pastry, frankfurter, salty snacks, hamburger meat. So it so you know they're probably grocery shopping on this one. And so it's gonna recommend whole milk, that uh, makes sense. Citrus fruit, then pip fruit, then shopping bags. And then it goes down the list. And we can see that, you know, uh, like regular grocery items are coming up towards the top. Let's look at the far end to see if it makes sense. Sugar, berries, and hygiene articles. Hmm. So here we've got rolls, soda, bottled water, pip fruit, and specialty chocolate. And so we see whole milk, other vegetables, and sausage. All right, let's look at the far end to see what happens. So this will be a basket that has very few items in it. So we've got whole milk and dessert. And it recommends yogurt, then rolls and buns. It's kind of interesting. A few items were skipped over for yogurt to come up to be more prominent. That's probably, a, uh, there's probably a connection between whole milk and yogurt. And what is not being recommended? UHT milk, meat and onions. Yeah, well, you know, they already have milk in their basket. Why would they get UHT milk? All right, so that's all I've got for now. I hope you're staying healthy and I hope you're enjoying the weekend. Take care and goodbye.